<laughs> nice shades, mate. <laughs> I'm in the fucking sun in LA. That that is the epitome of LA life. Uh, this is a. I have a guest house upstairs. See. Nice. And uh, so I rent it out, but it's empty. It's, I actually do Airbnb here, but I got people coming at three, so it's empty for now. It's my house and my house down for. Very nice, mate. I was. Uh, what is there? Have you got a lockdown in LA at the minute with COVID nineteen? Not lockdown, but uh, social distancing bullshit. You know, but I mean, it's uh, yeah, but it's pretty. Uh, it, it, you know, the people are pretty good here in regard to that. So the the they're, they're kind of following the rules. Most people. So it's just social distancing. There's times for shopping. I mean. Like uh, the supermarkets, eight to nine is older people, and then it's open. The big brand of supermarket here is a Ralph, and they used to be twenty four hours. Now they're eight to eight, and they're, they're closing. Uh, they're closing early, but the, so they've. I mean, it's all and shopping's rough. Like uh, a lot of things you can't get, so people are fucking hoarding stuff. And but yeah, it's a, it's it's serious here, I guess. Yeah, it started out here. It was. I, I think I paid it a little bit of lip service right at the start, and now it's like, oh man, this is this is serious stuff. With the prime minister, it's got very real, hasn't it? So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was talking about this morning. Very real. Um, quick question for you: Is this is this kind of situation that has never been had before? Is this a blessing for a Netflix release or not? I think so. I think that, uh, and I know I, I watch Netflix, and to be honest, I'm not over uh, excited about the content. You, you get some decent stuff, but a lot of the stuff I've found I've either seen or I've flicked through, and I think that, you know, it's new. So I think for my movie, it's interesting. I think people are going to watch it uh, because it's, I don't know what else is on. And I think that. It's a nice, it's a good film in regard to it, it deals with family. I think what's very interesting right now about this whole COVID situation is that a lot of families are spending time together, which I think, you know, life catches up with people. People go to work, they come home, they, you know, when they get home, they're talking about work or, or dealing with work, they eat, they go to bed. I think a lot of couples... Um, probably don't get to spend the time together and I think a lot of families are staying together now kids school all the time so the parents working and very limited time that families actually get together and communicate and I think now everyone's home I think it's been very I found it very health healthy I'm in a relationship I've been with a girl nine years I'm not married but we're as good as and she works six days a week you know eight to eight and so you know, we get very limited time and I've had a great couple of weeks just hanging out with her and, you know, catching up and you forget, uh, you know, you forget, you know, your relationship sometimes comes second to your life. And I think now people are realizing how important relationships are because, you know, they're afraid of losing someone. And um, I think people are coming together a lot more social distancing on the outside but families are kind of bonding i think and um i, I think it's a, a good 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 it's a good situation for families even though you know i always try to look for the positive so i think people are spending time together i think it's healthy for most families some families probably drive each other crazy but I th for me certainly i've enjoyed it's kind of it's put my relationship you know back into a primary situation rather than a you know secondary so I, I it's been good for me i've enjoyed it i don't know how long i'm going to continue like i need to get out and go to work but uh financially i'm sure the uh, population suffering uh but i think emotionally i think it's very healing for a lot of people a lot of families yeah i think so the, the, uh... It, like you said, some, some people it's hard, some people it's not. And, and definitely on an individual level, I know for myself and for my missus, is that, um, man, we, we like, well, she knows when she needs time to herself. For me, I just realise I've been around people too much. It's, all, <laughs> it's, a, it's the same end, but we, so we need to sort of uh, 
You just have Tyra Lone, I think, just because I, I think it's because just what we're used to, not because it's like a necessity, but what we're used to. And so it, it has been initially like quite tough. It's just stressful. And it's just different, I think, Gary. It's just you completely know, it's different what we're used funny. to, isn't it? You know what's funny? We, as a race, we, we go to work. I mean, I always have this, you know, battle with myself. I, I work a lot. I'm a bit of a workaholic. You go to work and you do it to provide for your family. And you spend the bulk of your good years when you're healthy working to make sure that your family never need anything. And by the time you retire, most people are pretty much knocking on death's door when they retire. My dad worked till he was in his 70s. Uh, he died in his early 80s. So when he finally took time to, you know, rest and probably, you know, spend time with his family, his, his life was over. And so I think we have to find a balance. I think, you know, people, we, we, we do it with the right intention, but in doing so, we neglect our lives at home. And, and at the end of the day, we're doing it for our lives at home, but then we're not getting the benefits because we never see each other. So... I think that this, for me, um, you know, it's been a bit of a wake-up call, like get your priorities right. And so I'll continue when things get back to normal to go to work and do what I do, but I'm going to really try and find family time. Um, I'll tell you what's interesting about this whole thing, too. My girlfriend's from Malaysia. She's Chinese-Malaysian. Um, I spent a lot of time in Thailand, and when I... You know, the Thai culture and the Chinese culture, you know, and you've got to remember that these cultures are far older than ours. When they don't hug and kiss and, you know, you see them, they bow, they take their shoes off when they go in, into the house. I used to think it was just rituals, but it's actually from years of going through these situations. That's why they don't shake hands. So I think people, Really? Yeah, because they've been through war and famine and, and disease for thousands of years. And I think that the culture came out of this kind of situation. I'm sure that in the future, people are going to be a lot more hygiene conscious. I certainly will be. Uh, you know, it's like I used to think people were, were rude who never shook my hand. but And I guess they are in a, in a degree uh, until you realize these situations. I'm sure people are going to be a lot less shaking hands when this is all over. Um not to be disrespectful, but, you know, hello from a distance or, you know, it's just, I, I just noticed a lot of the things that, that, and I started to read a little bit about, you know, old cultures, Asian and Indian, and this physical distance has been part of that culture. And as I've read further, it's basically stemming from these kind of situations over the thousands of years. They've been through far more than we have because the cultures are older. I mean, 5,000 years ago, it was all war. China was at war. And it, it, and you know, they talk about Asian people eating, you know, rats and this and that. But again, it comes from war. When there's nothing else to feed you, they found resource, resources to, to eat. Otherwise, they died. And so you start to look at the culture and reasons why cultures are taken on. And, and it's, it's fascinating. It's these kind of situations. I mean, in America, certainly the young country, but this is the first real situation, certainly, I think, that most Americans have lived through. It is war at some level, and and I think that it's, you know, opened a lot of people's eyes to uh, to see how cultures are formed, you know. Uh, I don't think they just, you know, there's, there's a reason why Asians are the way they are, and I think it's coming through times like this over the years. Yeah, I, that's a, a really good point, mate, actually, is that I think we, especially as in the West, uh, the more de- and, and in more developed countries, we sometimes can have that s- sort of small-minded, ignorant approach to if someone does something different to you, like they don't shake hands or they give you a wide berth or, or maybe they're like a really loud eater, especially the Chinese are concerned we see it as as rude and we've i'm not saying everyone but I, you know it's something that I, i've learned not to be like as i've gone on it's just through life experience especially where travel's concerned because it's not about rude it's just they don't conform to your idea of your customs like well, the chinese you must have been a lot on, in your profession you've traveled and you've seen the 
you know, you've seen different races in uh, different communities. So, you know, it's like a lot of people, certainly where I'm from, they've never left the building, they've never left the city. And so, <laughs> you know, when you start to travel, then I think you become a little bit more understanding of culture uh, because, and, and again, it's, you know, it's just different. It doesn't mean it's right, it's wrong. It's just different, you know. I think we've all, we're, we're, we're accustomed to how we're raised, but it doesn't particularly mean it's, you know, it's it's the only way. There's a lot of different cultures have different, and I think now, hopefully people will understand and respect culture, and it is what it is. It's like religion. It's For me, it doesn't matter where you're from, what religion, you, you know, we're all God's children, whatever that means, and, you know, we we just raise differently and, and we should respect that and, and learn from each other rather than, you know, judge. I think there's just so much to learn from. We can teach them things. They can teach us things. I mean, cultures, I, I find them beautiful and fascinating. So, um, yeah, I, but I think if you look at history and you look at the different countries and look at the history, you'll see a pattern of why those particular culture was formed. And, and, uh, and I think America and England will interact differently after this somewhat yeah yeah definitely uh the changes in the wind good or bad um mate can we can we come back we were talking about netflix i, I brought it up because obviously you you there am i right saying you directed uh the the new ronda rousey docu film i would call it film i ab- did about I- ronda yeah i pretty much wrote directed produced and financed so uh i, I did did it all. I um, I was but well I, done, by the way. Well, well done, mate. I, I right. really enjoyed it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Ronda Rosie, big fan of UFC. And then I saw it on Netflix. Ah, oh, new. There's a new because I didn't know it was coming out, and uh, flicked it on. And then it's uh, <laughs> yours truly narrating it. <laughs> Your old mate Gary's on there. Yeah. Um, I. I was, I've been doing a documentary, which is interesting. I called it, it's called Faith. It's not religious by any means. What is faith? Faith is believing in something, I guess, that you have no data. So, um, you know, I often wonder, you know, what is the definition of the word faith? Or what what does it mean? And so I, I call this documentary, I, I interviewed a bunch of different fighters, and they all come from incredible backgrounds. The stories are just remarkable. Uh, I think it's academy stuff, and it's not because of me, that's for sure. It's just I just got fortunate enough to meet and interview. I mean, I chose them very carefully. Um, a series of these interesting people in the fight game. And, I, and through that documentary that I've been working on for years, I'm about to finish it now. I think I'm smart enough to finish it now. Not smart enough, experienced enough to finish it now. I was playing with it for years, and and then something in me didn't, didn't, I, I, I didn't, for some reason, find the place to finish it. Now I'm at a place in my life where I will finish it. But I was doing that documentary. I interviewed a guy called Gene LaBelle, who pretty much was the first... Judo. First, judo Gene LaBelle. He trained Bruce Lee. I mean, he's a legend. Old man. But he was he had the first mixed martial arts fight, I think, recorded. He fought a boxer called Milo Savage in the 60s, I think it was. I'm not sure the exact date, but... And he broke Milo Savage's arm. Um, I think that was the first official MMA fight. So he's, you know, the, one of the pioneers. I was interviewing Gene, and at the gym, this is in 2010, was Ronda. And part of the deal that I got the interview with Gene, he said, I want you to help this girl. I said, you know, and he told me she's doing this cage fighting. And and I wasn't keen on it then. Um, I don't know if I'm particularly keen on it now. I'm just a little old-fashioned when it comes to ladies, but I respect women in sport. I think they're amazing. So, and they, you know, the women's MMA. I, I enjoy the fights more than the men's half the time. I mean, they're pretty amazing. But at the time, I was, you know, a little bit on the fence. I said, he said, she, she's a judo girl. She's doing mixed martial arts. Will you teach her some hands? So I said, sure. So I started working with Ronda, and then getting to know her. I found there was an interesting story. So I started to document it. Um, and it just kind of kept going. And and um, there was no UFC for women. She was adamant that she was going to make that change. And she did. I think Dana White on 
90 occasions publicly said he would never have women in the UFC. And he and she changed his mind. And the reality of it is, I don't know if you know this, but the the UFC was in business 20 years before Ronda. They were 16 or 18 million dollars in debt. They were about to go bust. Dana couldn't sell the company. He tried. He was get. He was going to sell it for like three, four million. They would, they would have lost the pants. But he ended up. R- Ronda had a fight uh, against a very tough girl and dismantled her pretty quickly and Dana got wind and said let, let me meet this girl uh, they met and she convinced him when it all went down the men in the division were like this is a joke it shouldn't be women so Dana said she's going to top the card so they went even more crazy about it uh, this is a joke blah 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 the fight went viral the first UFC fight she I think it grossed just under or just around 200 million which took which took the company into a huge amount of profit she then had another couple of fights that year and and basically grossed about a half a billion for the ufc this is a girl and then they sold ufc to img william morris for four billion conor mcgregor came along at the tail end of that deal um and so, really, this young girl changed the sport for men. So, whether you like her, whether you hate her, what she did is pretty amazing. And it just shows the power of women. Uh, and certainly, this young girl who, who kind of changed a man's sport. And so, she, uh, there's a lot of credit that's not given to Rhonda for what she actually did. She created a path for young girls now to make money in this sport. And and so she'll, she'll never be forgotten. She's the first UFC girl, and she'll always be remembered. Um, I think that the sport caught up, uh, you know, it caught up pretty quick. And I think Ronda, as she got more famous, I think she slowed down in, in the drive. I know she she left, uh, she was training at highest end with Olga Artevich and then Jean LaBelle. She'd been training with them her whole life. The two fights that she lost, she wasn't with them. She left them. She went training with uh, Edmund Tavernian, um, who I don't think was the best match for her because he wanted to create a striker. He comes from a striking background, and he tried to make her into a striker, which she wasn't. When I worked with Ronda, I always said, look, you know, uh, I'll teach your hands and all of the above, but don't throw away 20 years of judo or one year of boxing. And... Uh, I was just talking to Billy Dibb, who's a great fighter from England. He, he was friendly with Ronda, and he, he was at the Holly Holmes fight, and he, he was telling me that Ronda told him, I'm going to outstrike Holly Holmes. And Billy said, don't do it. Take her to the ground and uh, and beat her up on the ground. Ronda said, no, I'm going to prove a point. I'm going to outstrike her. And, of course, that didn't happen. And I think uh, I think she that was her demise. She tried to change her game plan based on a trainer telling her that she was so good with her hands, which she wasn't. Anyone can punch. Anyone, I take her on the mitt. You can learn to hit. You can learn to be very uh, dynamic and look amazing. But it doesn't work when you get in with somebody. You know, you can look a million dollars on the bag. You can look a million dollars on the mitts. But experience in boxing is learning the distance, the timing, the pocket where you're safe, where you're not. Holly Holm has been doing this for years. And there's a certain thing that you learn, and it's and it takes a long time to get that kind of experience. And Ronda didn't have it. She thought because she could hit hard that she could go in there and and, and you, you know punches are only hard if they land. And and uh, she wasn't able to land because Holly had the distance. She knew she knew the pocket, and it was a demise. So I really believe in my heart that the two girls that Ronda lost to Holly and Amanda Nunes. Had Ronda stayed with uh, highest end and go car, they would have made him made Ronda straight to the ground. I, I think she'd have won both fights on the ground. But you know that's it. It doesn't really matter. It is what it is. She still achieved what she achieved. She changed the sport. And the movie which I made, I was more interested in most fighters that I know do it in spite of, you know, we come from backgrounds, you know, England, you'll never be this, you'll never be that, and so you prove everybody wrong. Her father always believed in her, and, and when he died, she 
she had a different motivation and that was to prove him right and so that was the fascinating thing it was a different take it's just as much pressure to prove someone right as it is to prove someone wrong and so she she was driven by her father's belief before he died and that when he died she almost felt a burden that she had to prove him right that she was the greatest and that was her driving force that was what really it interested me in making this film and then as we developed and got to know our family i thought it was a really interesting story and and we ended up with the film that you just saw so yeah no mate it's uh, it's a good film and, and rondy <coughs> rondy ronda it's not just ronda like you said it's a it's a mother uh, i mean a mother herself i mean Mother was a, the first female, the first ever female judo gold medalist. First American world champion in judo, male and female. A male, male and female. First American yeah. world champion in judo. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, the Americans. There was never a world champion till Ronda's mum. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I almost think, it, looking back in retrospect with Ronda, and I know like MMA expert, but looking back in retrospect with Ronda, it sort of echoes some some other sort of journeys that you could you could metaphorize this with but it's almost as if she progressed she had she progressed that quickly up the ranks with so so little octagon time you think the cumulative amount of minutes she would have had inside an octagon when she came up against holly home and the sport around her because of what she'd done and being that catalyst behind women's mma all of a sudden as she gets to the point where uh, as she's at the peak you've got these savages coming in who are in other disciplines like holly holm who's a, an amazing striker you know and, and then the experience inexperience where ronda's concerned maybe at that point and absolutely take on board um the edmund comments i i agree but it's almost i mean edmund it, was making comments in the paper i was laughing you know i mean it's a joke. i mean first and foremost he he, he told everyone who's a world champion boxer you know you can't say them things when he said he was a world champion kickboxer. I mean, you can't come up with them, them kind of comments now when there's internet. You know, it's we can just punch his <laughs> president from time. You know, in the old days, you could say what you want, but now the information's available. So, you know, he, you know, he, he, I, I started to read things when she left us that she could beat Mayweather. And I mean, it was laughable. And so, you know, when you've, Training with someone that delusional. When she trained at highest, and she worked with all the guys, there was a bunch of Armenian animals. They, I mean, they're they're the toughest kids. They're the best people. I tell you, they're, they're, I've made so many great friends. The Armenian community is such an amazing community here in LA. It's a big community. But you know, I got to know the boys, and they took me in like you know, like family, and and they're just a great bunch of guys. But she worked with these guys, and they, they you know. She used to cry, and used to beat her up. But that's what made her. When she left and she was with Edmund, he pretty much isolated her. She was training on her own. She was famous now, so they closed the gym. It would be... That's not what makes great fighters. You've got to get in there. It's like the front gym. You go there and you train and you're just one of everybody else. And if you don't make the mark, you come second. And second's no place in this sport. And so she was fighting for her life every day at Heist. And it kept her on edge and it kept her sharp and it kept her you know, doing what she's doing. And I think that, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And, and she changed a lot of things. And I, I, you know, and I think that, and she became estranged with her mum. Her mum, who's her life, did not approve of Edmund, uh, did not approve of the whole situation. And all of a sudden now, you know, when you think about Rhonda, the driving force with her, was her father. So her driving force was love. Most, you know, I always talk about love, you know, if you hate someone, you're not going to kill them. I mean, you hate someone, you might have a fight with them. And it doesn't create death. But someone gets between a mother and a child, the, the, the mother will kill you. You get between a family and, and you get into situations where love's involved. It gets very different. And so Rhonda, in her, her motivation was to prove her father right. So it was a love-based thing that give her extreme, you know, she'd go to bed at night and think about her dad and train and, she had to prove him and never good enough in her mind. Incredible motivation. When you break up a family, 
which basically happened before the Holly Holm fight. Uh, Ronda's mum didn't go to the fights. The only fight she never went to, she said, I won't support ah. it. If you're with this guy, I will not support it. She publicly went on YouTube saying, but Ronda's mum, she's funny, she said, if, it was, if I could get away with it, I would run him over in the car. You know, she, she made it very public, her dislike. She never went to the Holly Holm fight. And when you get all these kind of things, mentally, I think it affects you. And... There were many things that affected Ronda in that fight. But as you as you understand, being an MMA fan, if you look at the Gracie days, when he was fighting these guys, it looked like bar fights. He was a skilled MMA uh, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy, jiu-jitsu guy. And he was getting rid of people because he was just highly skilled. And then if you look at the, the, the opponents he had then, to the opponents now, the sport has advanced so much. There's some incredible athletes now in MMA. They're, they're pretty amazing at everything. I don't think they're great at anything. So, of course, they're chosen profession like Ronda Judo or whoever, but they're not great with their hands, but they're proficient. But they're good at everything. And, and, um, and the sport has come on so quickly. And I think that Ronda, I think the girls caught up pretty quick. When she first was dominant she was the first real olympic standard judo olympic standard athlete in the sport so she was a little bit ahead of everybody else but that soon changed and all of a sudden you were getting other olympic athletes and other world-class athletes crossing over to mma and as as her career uh, went forward so did the athletes catch up and and so you know i think now um would she have been as dominant in the field that's out there now? Probably not, because these girls are all at a certain level that I don't think they were in the beginning. Do you know what's crazy? You know, so what she what she was the catalyst. And uh, sorry, what she was the catalyst of in USC, and then the wider impact. Because I don't want to do a disservice to other people like Misha Tate and, and all the rest of them. They all played their part. But you, but uh, Ronda brought it to the forefront of of people's. Of, of people's minds they brought they put USC as a sport in front of people who would otherwise have never heard of it and became fans when you look at it now the 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 absolute killers female killers mate who are fighters like Joanne Jedicek, uh you got Thug Rose and, and Holly Holm and people like that right what's just struck me with the sport of USC is now as I perceive it now I will quite I will look forward to a women's match uh, women's bout yeah. as much as a male as much as a male and what's what's interesting is I can't say that about any other sport it's always something lacking on the women's side because of the just because I it's a physiological different thing and it seems to play out more in other places. Uh, like football versus football. When I watch a ladies football match against a men's football match, the men always seem to be quicker, they're hitting it harder, they're going stronger. And that's not a disservice to the way the women play, it's just the fact that it's men and women. But in, in the UFC, I don't see it as that. I don't know why that is. Women I think it's just because... Women are the better fights. They are. And I've never seen, you know, I see these women fights, they come out like they've been in a car crash. And these are young, feminine, beautiful girls. I mean, a lot of them are beautiful. They could be models. I mean, I, you know, I, I get crushes on all of them. There's like so many beautiful girls in the UFC. Paige Van Zandt and all these different girls. They're, they're stunningly beautiful and they're as tough as nails. And, and, they, and, they, and they get into it like, uh, it, you know, Women, as a as a general, I'm not saying this. Uh, I I just think I think they're smarter than men, and I think that they are. You know, they're different. You know, there's a book. Is it Venus and Mars or whatever? Men of Venus and women. Of, I can't even remember. <laughs> but we are very different, and and I believe we're equal, but we're very different in our in in our makeup and our. And I just think women have. You know, they're, they're incredible. I mean, uh, my girlfriend, little, petite, Asian, highly educated. But, you know, talk about if you had to have someone back you. You know, I have a friend in England, Terry Rhodes. She's a most feminine, beautiful lady. She's a businesswoman. We was in a bar years ago and a bunch of guys kicked off. And I tried to stop it, and they come at me. She went over the table 
Like, and she was so committed. Uh, five, eight guys, big dudes. Like, it was a scary situation. And she went over the table and they just stopped. And it was terrifying. She was like a lioness. And after the situation, it all went down. I was like, Terry, she was so fearless because she loves me. She's like one of my best friends. She's like, you know, fuck these guys. She would have died. And it really woke me up. I thought, I've never seen a man. She was <laughs> dangerous. And I was like, she's a feminine lady. And, and But I said, Terry, she said, Gary, fuck these people. They, they want to fight with you. They're going to fight with me. And and it was like a, it was a moment I never, ever forgot. I mean, look at the wild, the lionesses. They're, they're the hunters. The males look after the pride, but the lionesses do the work. They hunt. They, they. I mean, we're different. But, but yeah, I think MMA has shown the... The ferocity and the and the resilience and the strength of women and it's uh they you know they're pretty scary you know so savages mate if you look back you referenced it earlier without you you were talking about Ronda if they you used to reference laugh at me as a, when I was growing up in the fight game I was a young kid and I was you know I, I, they used to say oh pretty boy and all this bullshit and they thought because I was not, I didn't look like a monster that I couldn't fight. And they, of course, they found out different when they got in with me. But uh, but that's a guy. So you know, they 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 look down at a guy who was semi normal looking, who didn't look like a <laughs> that 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 would be diminish me as a fighter. But we go to a whole another level when you see a feminine, beautiful girl. You dress these girls up and you take them out on a Friday night. They're the most beautiful feminine girls. But come Monday morning in the cage, I mean, it just shows, you know. Um, but again, I think, you know, the sport has come on, the science of the sport. But what, what's interesting about the girls in UFC is that when all the science goes out the window and it gets down to a brawl, tough as nails, these girls, fearless, fearless. Yeah. So uh, my hat's off to them, you know. And again, it was Ronda who really paved the way for that to happen. Because uh, I don't think without Ronda, UFC would have, would have ever taken go. Maybe down the line, another Ronda would have come along, but it just so happens that she was the one. Yeah. Mate, I was going to I was gonna say, I was going to mention that the strike force fight with Ronda and Misha, where, where Ronda gets her in that armbar. Now, for people listening or watching, they don't know what an armbar is. It's where you try, where the opponent gets your arm in such a way they're trying to bend it the wrong way. So you're bending your elbow the wrong way through 90 degrees against the elbow. And Ronda gets Misha in the armbar, right? And two things happen here, which makes them both savages. Ro- Misha does not tap out. So, so Misha's like, nah, I ain't tapping out and giving up. So Ronda goes all the way and, and, and busts her elbow and bends Misha's arm the wrong way. You remember the fight? It bends it the up, wrong yeah. way. It's at about 45 degrees, the arm, the forearm's going 45 degrees the wrong way. And Misha isn't tapping. And Ronda is going, stuff you there, I'm going to keep going. The pair of them, mate, savages. It took the referee to stop them. Unbelievable. Broke Unbelievable. She, she broke the arm in that fight. It took year, a, a year for Misha to, to rehabilitate the arm. She wouldn't break, she wouldn't, she wouldn't tap. So Ronda, I spoke to Ronda, she said she ain't going to, Ronda didn't want to break it because she knew it would be, it would hurt her career, it would maybe end her career. But she said she wasn't tapping, so I just said, fuck it, I'll break her arm. So she broke her arm. Crazy. Did you stay close to the, to the Rousey family through, throughout uh, the UFC career? I stayed close to Ronda throughout and a mum, still with a mum. But, you know, it's very sad, the business side of film. Ronda's agent, uh, Rhonda saw the film. She came to my house, loved the film. Uh, she's with William Morris, uh, Brad Slater. I went and met Brad. Brad loved the movie. William Morris wanted to take the movie and control it. I wouldn't allow them. So he pretty much said, if you don't let us handle the movie, we'll, we will not get behind the movie. And so I, I would not allow it to happen. And I said, you know, It's an honor. Are you breaking up there? Hello? I've got people... I, I know pe- people have been emailing me who hate Rhonda. I don't know why, but they don't like her. And they saw the movie and now they love her. So I said to Brad Slater, the agent, this is such an amazing piece to show Rhonda to the world and people who particularly 
may not be fond of her, that when they see this, they'll really see the real Ronda and fall in love with her. And he basically said, if you don't give us the movie and we control it, then we're not behind it. So my relationship with Ronda became not as strange, but she's, he's her agent and she's loyal to her agent. So she didn't really get behind the movie uh, as much as I would have liked because it would have caused a lot of friction with the agent. William Morris offered me $500,000 advance on the film, uh, but they wanted to do what they wanted to do with it, and I wouldn't allow them to do that. I have it in black and white. I have the contracts. I have the emails. And because I turned it down, so the movie that they don't want to get behind, they offered me $500,000, and um, I turned them down. And now they're, you know, not negative, but they're just try to pull Ronda away from it. But, you know, I, I don't need Ronda to even be behind it. It's The movie is what it is. It's honest. It's pure. It's an incredibly, uh, you know, real uh, depiction of, of Ronda's rise. Uh, and so the movie stands for itself. Uh, I would have loved Ronda to be behind it. and But, you know, her agent was not, happy with uh, not having the control and that's the business of film and so it is what it is I think uh, like I said you enjoyed it that, that you don't necessarily need her to you know publicly publicly um, plug it so to speak but the, the fans behind that it's a good movie how did you I right? the movie. She came to my house and loved the movie I mean she absolutely was so excited the agent put the stick in there. I mean, we were going to go with the... William Morris would be a great company to represent the movie, but the terms that they wanted uh, were not the terms that I wanted. And so that didn't happen. And, of course, if you don't play with them, then... But, you know, Lionsgate, one of the best distribution companies in the world, uh, saw the movie and took it on. Uh, that says enough for itself. And then, of course, Netflix have now got behind it. So... Uh, the movie speaks for itself. Uh, it's it's interesting that I'm I'm getting a lot of incredible ten out of ten reviews, and then I'm getting a few two out of ten. So it's funny. <laughs> no one no one in the middle. It's either love it or hate it. So uh, it, it's That's... funny. It's like it's one of I, which I don't mind. I mean, I I didn't make it to please anyone. I just made an honest film, and and uh, if they love it, amazing. And if they don't. I'm sorry, but, you know, it, it, the movie is just what it is. And, and you know, it's funny. People talk about the production value on, on some of the scenes. You know, I, I shot it in a way, and it's funny. I went to London Film Festival, Crystal Palace, and a very smart critic said, Gary, what I loved about the movie is the beginning of the movie is kind of rough, and as she develops and becomes more and more successful, the editing gets slicker, the film get, looks more beautiful, and... And that's the, re that's the way I shot it, very subtly. That was a creative choice that I made. As she developed, the movie developed. And so it was a, it was a choice that it, I made. I shot all of the footage on the same cameras, those high-quality cameras. It's just that I wanted the early stuff to look rough, and I wanted it to get more and more polished as the film, as she got more and more polished in her life. And that was a creative thing that I... I um, I decided on and that was one of the critics at Crystal Palace said that's why I voted for you to win the best documentary because of that create I thought it was a very you know so it's just you know people uh, everyone's allowed their opinion but you know I made the film I wanted to make and I'm, I'm very happy my partner Pete Antico and my girl Yinsi Lu we, we, we all made the film we wanted to make and uh you know, would, would I do di things differently on my next film? Sure, you learn every day, but I I'm happy with the movie. I think the movie's inspiring. I think it shows the strength of women. I think it shows a great, uh, a great motivation of love and family. And, you know, I think it covers a lot of interest in... Uh, it shows you a lot more the uh, It shows you the foundations of what... You know, Rocky's about an underdog, but one would say, why did he fight? You know, what's his story before he got into fighting? And so this, this for me, shows the next level of what 
what makes people become fighters and, and uh, uh, I'm very happy with it. How did uh, how did you Gary Stretch end up um, from being a kid in Lancashire? You're Lancashire, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, I call you sir because you're you know. Bond. Don't call me sir. Don't Bond. call me sir. Fuck <laughs> off. I'm terrified. Don't say that. You, I wouldn't fight you for a million bucks. I'd run a mile. <laughs> You'd have to catch me. <laughs> Uh, how did you, Guy Stretch from Lancashire, end up, mate? End, how did you, no, not end up. How did you start this journey that took you through an incredible boxing career, um, you know, nearly or shoulda, woulda, coulda beaten Eubank all the way through that curve to, you know, being in movies alongside Colin Farrell, you know, in Alexander, Dead Man's Shoes, I'm alongside Paddy Considine, and now directing your own. I'll tell you the story. So Martin Serene is an English actor, um, good friend of mine. And so he was in Hollywood trying to make it as an actor. And Martin said to me, I was trained in Vegas with Freddie Roach. I used to fly London, LA, LA, Vegas. I never stayed in LA. It was just a stopover from the flight from London, LA, LA, Vegas. And I trained in Vegas and Martin used to say, why don't you come to LA? Come to LA. Anyway, when I was about to retire, um, and I retired for all the wrong reasons, Poli politics. Uh, I got off of the Eubank fight five weeks before the fight. I hadn't trained in a year. I'd been off. And really? I'd sat, I'd sat out of contract. And so I sat out. When the contract ended, I got a phone call, fight Eubanks, four and a half weeks. I hadn't even ran in seven months. I called, I called Freddie Roach. He said, impossible. You cannot do it. He said, you can beat Eubanks all day. You can stand him on his head too smart for him, too fast, too slick, but you need to have the wind. You need to have, you know, you need to have condition because he'll, he'll get to you and he gets to everybody late. And if you're not in great shape, he'll get to you. And so if you're in great shape, Gary, I have no question you'll beat him. And I had no question. I knew exactly how to beat him. I felt, I watched him and studied him. I, I knew how to beat him. The problem being, I didn't have the time. So I, Freddie said, don't do the fight. I wanted to fight because I've been sat in the top few in the world at junior middleweight, couldn't get a title fight. It was avoided like the plague. I was supposed to fight Michael Nunn in Paris. He pulled out. I was plagued with trying to get world title fight. Chris Pyatt was uh, Honeygan and all these guys. I was trying to get matches with. They, they did. I could. My promoter either promoted them also or wouldn't put us together. And, it was just a nightmare. So, I, you know, I got to the top few in the world and I was sat around just twiddling my thumbs, trying to get a title if I couldn't. Ended up sitting out the contract, wanting to go my own way. As I became a free agent, I got the Eubanks fight. Took it short notice and the rest is history. But on back to acting, I was traveling back from Vegas. I pretty much not sure what I was going to do with my life. I was tired of boxing and the politics. And I decided to visit my friend in LA. So rather than go straight home, I stayed in LA for a couple of weeks. And the first day I was here, my friend was going on an audition, picked me up from the airport. And he said, I've got to do this audition. I said, I'll wait in the car. And I we was on Hollywood and Vine, middle of Hollywood. And an old lady, it was raining, was backing into a parking space. And two guys, young kids, like little gangbanger dudes, were trying to steal her space. And they got to a conflict. And all the cars are stopping. There was, you know, neither one could park in the space. And the guy got out the car and he ran and punched the old lady's window. And this is an old lady in the seventies. I'm, I'm sat in the car thinking, well, I've been in LA literally twenty minutes. I'm thinking, my <laughs> God. So I didn't do anything. I just sat there. And then he proceeded to go round and snap off a windshield wiper. And so I got out the car and I said, well, what are you doing? Wonka. And yeah, a little old lady, and he was a kid, 25, something, I don't know, and I was about the same age, maybe a little bit older, and he turned and pulled a flick knife on me, so now I'm stood, I've been in LA 20 minutes, and I've got a fucking guy with a knife telling me he's going to kill me for a 10 cent meter, so I said, what, what are you doing, I'll fucking kill you, but I said, you want to kill me for a meter, I, I said, number one, the lady got the spot, and, you know. And he's walking towards me with the knife. He's not a big knife. 
And so I said, fine, you want to do it? Let's do it. And he stopped. Well, I said, come, come do it. You know, you want to fucking stab me? Let's do it. I have no, no question. I'd have knocked him out before he got anywhere near me, but he just froze. And anyway, basically he shit himself. I took the knife off him, told him to go take a walk. He left. I, I parked the old lady's car. I said, do you want a knife here? If they come back, you can stab him. <laughs> And basically, she got out the car and we had a discussion. I love old people. Uh, I'm always a sponge to learn. And she was the most incredible old lady. Her name was Janet Alhanty. And she said, are you an actor? I said, no, I'm a professional boxer. And we talked. And then we got talking about food. I loved cooking. I don't know how the fuck food got my book. And then she basically said, I owe you lunch. I said, great. Well, before you leave, you're, you're going to be here for two weeks. Let's have lunch. I said, great. So she had a card with a name, but no number. She wrote a number in with a pen. I got back in the car. My friend come out with the audition. We're driving. He almost crashes the car. Where'd you get the number? I said, why? He said, do you know who that is? I said, no idea. Famous acting teacher. And basically, I went and had lunch with her. <laughs> and I ended up studying her, with her for 20 years. And <laughs> she changed my life. God damn her. She just Mate. died. She just died, but um, oh, no. she was an incredible woman. She worked with the greatest of the greats. Every, every, you name it, she worked with them. And um, and she I, she took me under her wing and I studied with her and and, uh, and the rest is history. And then I got into, you know, acting and all the other stuff. And, and every film that I've ever done, I've always, you know, you look at it and you think, why did they do it this way or that way? And it's a natural progression to direct. And the Ronda film was a great transition for me because it was a subject I know about. And and now I'm looking to do feature, probably. I don't know if I'd do another documentary. It's a lot of work. And, you know, a, a feature is probably something I'm, I'm going to do next. So I'm, I'm looking at the Bob Champion story, the jockey from England. Um that's a film that I'm very interested in, in, in remaking. It got it was made years ago. I wasn't crazy about the original, uh, but I would love to make that. I'm talking with, I've talked to Bob about it already. He's excited to do it again. Uh, so that's a possibility. And I have a few other things on the, on the pipeline. So we'll see. But that's basically my transition from boxing. So... And it, um, I'm from England, as you know, and I'm from the north of England, and jokes and stories we grew up with. We never had much money growing up, so the only way we would make have a laugh is a joke or, you know, storytelling, and it's part of my culture, our culture, so I've always loved story, and and um, and my dad used to say, when are you going to get a real job? You know, actor and boxer, you know, he was a plumber, he's like, when are you going to get a real job? So... It's uh, and the funny thing is, again, it's a subject you can talk about at some point. Is that you know, it's very, very scary for fighters. I turned pro very young because I had a successful amateur career. Turn pro, you know, you retire at 25, let's say 28 or 30. 30 is probably the average age. You know, when you've done this profession, you don't have another profession, you don't have a particularly good education. So now you've you're in the world. 30, you've still got most of your life ahead of you. You've got no background to fall on. You've got no education to fall on. You have no work skills. Most fighters end up dead, jail, or on a park bench drunk. And because it's a scary, scary situation to be in, to have, if you don't make it, and 1%, let's say, make it, what do you do next? And, you know, there's not a pension plan for fighters which is scary there should be I think um, a lot of them don't you know thank God England has a decent medical system but in America these guys come out the game damaged they don't have medical insurance they don't have education they don't have any kind of skills it, it's a scary place to be so I, I feel blessed that I fell into this situation and found something that I love film and that I've been fortunate enough to work. Uh, but again, it's, uh, you know, I studied for many years, so it, I didn't, it's not luck again. I remember my friends used to say to me, I can't believe you're making so much money for one night as, in a fight. 
And I say, one night is 20 years to get this night. For the last 20 years, I've been doing it for nothing. And Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's Eve, I'm up at five. All my mates, 16 years of age, parties with girls and discos. And I was in bed at 10 o'clock at night for years and years and years. You miss out on so much. And then you get, you know, a little bit of success and people go, wow, it's amazing. But it, it takes you 20 years to become an overnight success, you know. I mean, that's the reality. Yeah, in, you touched on an interesting subject there, um, and it the, it reminded me of what uh, some there's a there's not a narrative. There's a lot of focus at the moment, or there seems to be. A, bear in mind, I'm in the military veteran bubble of communications and social media and all that, so it appears to me sort of higher than what it is in in what it is to Joe public. But it's around mental health. Uh, mental illness, mental fitness, you know, and um, and helping service leavers get out and transition into the in, out of the military into civvy street. And as I've had my own journey with that, I got out. Oh man, nine, nearly nine years ago now. Um, I see a lot of similarities in in the the causes of a bad transition from one way of life to another not just, but, and I see the similarity between the military and sports people because there's it's two th- there's, like a, there's one thing to what you do when that's ripped away it's like, that's the way of life I know it's all I've done it's institutionalization that gets ripped away like someone getting made redundant okay and the job's gone all of a sudden day one day on, on, on day two they're in the same oh my god I am in an unknown world you don't know what to do but there's an additional factor that should be that should be uh, considered on the military side and for the on for the most part on the on the sports person side whatever that sport may be and that is that it's not just that we've been in that role for, in that career for 10 15 20 years 30 years and so we've forgotten how to do anything else for people like um myself for people like yourself i'm assuming you got into boxing dead young um, and these MMA fighters and American football players and soccer players and rugby players who have all they've ever done since they left school was that sport. It's not that they've forgotten to do everything else. They never knew. They never knew how to live a normal life. So you take them out of um, – you look at someone, they get taken out of a, a big rugby team, international sports, and they're retiring, and you plonk them into retirement. You know, Well, the obvious avenues are – pundit, commentator, coaching, the usual stuff. They don't want to do that. What are they there? How They don't see any opportunity for themselves. Whereas from the outside now, me being away from that, I've made that transition yourself as well. You can see there's so much opportunity. But that transition from being the elite of whatever you did to I'm not doing that anymore is an absolute nightmare. Did, you know, did that... You know- you know, it's funny. My brother Conrad is in England. Uh, great businessman. He's always had his own company, but he's just started working for another company. Um, and he's work. And it's funny because uh, he, he he saw this job advertised, and he and he applied, and it was not something that he'd ever done. But what it does is he's worked for a company. I don't know the name. I would even give him a plug because it's pretty amazing what they're doing. So. Basically, they are a company who, my brother talks to people in these dead-end jobs who don't have any background, don't have a skill, don't have any kind of education. And the company trains them if you want to be a plumber. So they set up a finance situation where the the, the guy who's in this dead-end job, they finance him to go to school maybe 40 bucks a month or something, that's all he has to pay. And why he's working in the job that he doesn't like, they train him for like a year. They turn him into skilled professionals and then place them. And my brother said, I've never had so much fulfillment. Some amazing people just don't really have the education or the background or come out of some kind of other profession like myself, sport, military. And they really don't see a future. And now they get an opportunity that, my brother meets them, talks to them, see what they want to do, what's their ambition, where they want to go, finds the job that they wanted to do, sets up the training course, puts them through this school, and then after a year, 
they play some and they change the whole life. And my brother said, you know, I never thought I would enjoy something like this, but I'm seeing regular people suddenly get a chance to have an incredible life or a, a much better standard of living. And so I'm not sure what the company is, but it's pretty cool to me. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a very scary place. I, I mean, without, without doing what I did, thank God when I retired from boxing, I, I had s some financial security, but if I hadn't, and I hadn't met this old lady, and the thing is, when I met the old lady, I was in a position where I could, you know, who can be in a position to go to LA and, and give yourself these opportunities? A lot of people where I'm from don't have that luxury. And so if I'd have retired from boxing and had nothing, gone and I'm back home in England, all of a sudden, um, almost 30, don't have anything, don't have any education, no profession. What, what am I going to do? And it's embarrassing because, you know, you, you can be in the public eye and people see you like you're someone, but doesn't there's a lot of these guys who, I remember being famous in England, walking down the street, signing autographs, and I didn't have a pot to piss in. I was still on my way up, and these promoters, they put you in positions, they rent houses and cars for you, and the money comes and training camp. You ended up, you're not getting any, you're not getting rich. They, they're very, they put you in a space where you have to fight. They, they, they kind of fool you with this standard of life, and you think you're fine, but you really don't have much. You, you're fighting to really pay your bills, and they keep you keen to keep you lean, and they... So all of a sudden you end up, you, if things go wrong and you you wake up one day and your career's over, the, the, the fucked up thing about fighting is, you know, two losses in a row, you're not hot anymore. And so you can be 25 and 0 and have two losses and then all of a sudden you, nobody's interested. So it's a very, very tough business. And even if you have 25 and 0 wins, you're not making money to be a champion. Only the champions make the money. And so if I'd have been in that situation and, and been in England and had no nothing, to, no financial security, I, I, what would I have done? I don't know. And it's embarrassing. You know, it's like people look at you and they, they look down at you because they want, they, you know, it's like you're living the dream or they think. And no, it's, it's not that way. 1% of the fighters are making money. I mean, 1%. Even the UFC. I know a lot of guys who are very, very famous uh, don't have a dollar, struggling, don't have professions. They've committed to this since they're young. They got to the end of the road. They're too old, and they got nothing. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very scary profession. It's it's either make it or you, or you have a hard fall, you know, coming down. Do you, um. If you can give an opinion on it, do you think that the Reebok deal, the Reebok sponsorship deal with the UFC, was a good thing generally for fighters, or a bad thing in terms of money? I don't know. I don't know the deal. They're all tied by NDAs, aren't they? I know they all have a deal. They all have this Reebok deal. I'm not sure exactly what what the deal uh, ensues for the fact that. You know, you've got to remember, unless they're getting a really great deal, I'm sure that they are tied to something and can't do anything else. So unless the deal's fruitful for them, it doesn't make sense because if they didn't have the deal, they could probably find deals elsewhere better. But uh, the UFC is certainly a... Uh, it, it's a lot... I mean, they, Dana White, the UFC controls everything. So it's... The good thing is, I think they genuinely or generally make money at the top level. I know a lot of guys in US who are not making money. I know Randy Couture, uh, he was in Bonda's film and I got to talk to him. He's not at all a fan of UFC and the, and the monopoly that they've created. Um, so th there's a lot of, there's, you know, it's on the fence. There's, there's, there's pros and cons. Uh, only the top few, the top percentage of UFC guys are making money. And if you look at the money they're making, I mean, if you look at Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, uh, or any of the top boxers, they're making 50 times more than the UFC guys. And you can talk 
telephone numbers with what UFC guys are making. But I know the reality of they're not making the money that you're reading about. It's all uh, I know guys in the in the game they're not making anything like the top level professional boxer making, and that's because it's manipulated. It's one organization. Um, you know the thing is with the boxing. People laugh at it. There's like ten belts, but there's ten opportunities to make money in UFC. It's UFC. That's it. I mean, there's Bellator. There's a couple of other organisations, but again, you're in one or the other. If you're in one, that's your monopoly. And so, um, man, I think generally the UFC guys make more than the average professional boxing guys, but the top level fighters are making five times what the UFC guys are making. So it's a catch-22. I think a lot of the UFC guys, UFC guys are making a good living. I don't think it's a retirement living. And then the 1% are making crazy you know, crazy money in relationship to the, to the others. But in the big scheme of sport, the UFC guys are not making the money. They're not making the basketball players' money, the soccer players' money, the professional boxers' money. UFC, they're, ma- they're making these big fights in the threes and five millions, top, top, top fights. They're not making the tens, twenties, thirties. Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather, 300 million. And it just shows no. Floyd Mayweather, a kid, uneducated. I think he's a very bright guy. But he, if Floyd Mayweather is making 300 million for his last fight, which he made, what have these promoters been making for the last 50 years <laughs> as fighters? Well, I mean, you know this. You referenced boxing and politics earlier, and boxing is not a world I, uh, uh, in term, uh, like a commercial world, I understand it all, um, I, just because I've never been involved in it. But just on the stuff, I mean, from the UFC side of things, comparing the pay to the boxing, I mean, it's my opinion, and we're talking it being a, it, this, it must be a benefit for the sport. So I'm talking about the sport of MMA. Whichever promotion you're looking at, UFC, Bellator, One FC, any of those, it it has to be better for the sport if the athletes in that sport are, are getting um, getting paid on average better than a, a rival sport. No, Dana yes, White. Not- I say what about Dana White. I got to know him a little bit. He's a, he's a good guy, and and you know, I mean, it's not charity. It's a, it's a it's a business, and if you're good at the business, you get you make a lot of money. And but Dana. He really looks kind of looks after his fight, fighters generally. I think he's genuinely a good guy, um, and they're all making a decent living. And and uh, I, I think on a general scheme of things, he's very very good for the sport. Are they making the money that Dana White's making in the UFC? No, I don't know what the percentage is, but the, the, they're not. The UFC are making a lot more than the money that they're giving the fighters, so it's a great business. Do they get paid <laughs> well generally? Yes. Do they get the money they really should get? I probably think no. Um, but Dane has got this kind of, it's kind of a strange policy. I don't think the big guys are making as much as they should, but the little guys are making probably a little more than most guys in the you know, like the low end guys in the professional boxing world are getting zero, whereas the low end guys, if they're in the UFC, they're making something. So, um, I think he's even the the ground out a little bit UFC, but uh, in in regard to an organisation, like if you look at the WBC and the world rankings, when you get below forty, no one's making any fifty, no one's making any money. Whereas if you get the UFC and you get down the rankings, I think they're all making something. So, you know, it's, again, it's a business. It's, it's just it's, a business. And at the end of the day, the, the heads of that business are running a business. It what, gets um, to the point Conor McGregor when the public overtakes that business where there's a demand. If you get these stars like Conor, he can then... And Ronda, and Ronda. And Ronda, and maybe John Jones to a degree. Uh, but you get a few of these people with, with the Midas touch. I mean, Conor McGregor's one of the smartest promotional business guys in the world. But he's not, But the interesting thing about Conor is the real deal in the fact that, love him or hate him, he fights anyone. He's got the biggest set of balls in the world. He's, uh, he says everything he does. He puts himself out there. He's 
moved, he's fluctuated at weight, he's took on, like Connor, he shows up every fight. I mean, he's the epitome of, of, you know, he talks a lot, but he backs it up and, and he takes risks all the time. And, and, and 99% of the time he, he gets through the risk and, and, and prevails. So you have to pay guys like that because he makes, he makes the sport so exciting. He's like, there's nothing like a Conor McGregor fight. He just, it, you know you're in for something very special every time he t- every time he shows up. And uh, do I love some of the antics? Not always, but it's a show, man. So it's like you, yeah. you venture is the guy they love to hate. Uh, and so, but he, whether you're going to go and watch him win or hopefully watch him get beat, doesn't matter for Chris. He just knows that they're showing up. And if they're showing up, they're paying for a ticket. And if they're paying for a ticket, he's making money. So, you know, at the end of the day, I suppose if you sat Connor in a room, uh, you know, he's probably a lovely guy who turns it on when he goes to work and turns it off when he goes home. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I um, it, it's a it's a strategy, right? Be the bastard. It's a strategy that works. Look at Nick Day, Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz, Floyd Mayweather is one of them. Eubanks one of them. Conor McGregor, be the be the bastard. But maybe uh, John Jones. Oh no, no, not John Jones. Well, sort of John Jones, but I love in the- <laughs> he's my favorite of all of them. But um, oh god, where was I going with that? I mean, to reference your point. You could sit him down in a room. He could be cool. I could not stand Tyson Fury. I, I could not stand Tyson Fury because of all of the banter and it was sort of, uh, uh, it was sort of before I understood, really sort of really understanding. Ah, this is the way to do things. This is business. They're uh, they're Tyson promoting Fury. their own fight. I love him, and I tell you what, I, I love I love the whole family. And I'm not being funny. If you what, if you interview every one of that family, Tyson Fury's father. Did an amazing job with the kids because Tyson, I think, like, I mean, he's he's fucking amazing, really. I mean, look what he's done. Number one, I mean, he goes to Klitschko's back garden, beats him. Goes to Deontay Wilder's back garden, beats him. Every single thing he said, he's done. He beat Deontay Wilder the first fight; they got the draw. He beat him for eight rounds out of twelve, and and. But look at how we beat him coming off two years of complete drug abuse. Like, you've got to understand something. If you're in the fight game and you train 100% to get ready for a fight, you do everything right, you're up at six, you're better at eight, your food, your diet, you're still terrified. The balls that man had to go in that ring, having had years of abuse and drink and when he goes to bed at night, he knows he's not... When he fought uh, Deontay Wilder the first time, he was a shadow of what he could have been. And he's fighting the biggest puncher in the in the heavyweight, probably in heavyweight history, the most dangerous man on the planet in the boxing world. Tyson Fury, this larger-than-life character. But when he goes home at night and turns the light off and he's alone in bed, the fear that must have gone through his mind or the doubt because of all the time he's drinking or doing drugs or doing whatever it all catches up because it makes you think i'm I'm not going to be you know i did it and you can't you can't get them doubts the only thing that makes you incredibly confident is preparation and he was not he had not prepared when you've had two years of abuse a lot of doubt in your mind and for him to walk up them steps with the fighting them a monster that no one would fight you have to absolutely take your hat off, and then and then to get up off the fucking floor. I mean, and to do what he did. He's an incredible human being, and and then when you hear him talk, as mad as he is, he's very smart, extremely intelligent, and he's so normal. I, when he first came on the scene, I wasn't sure, but the more I look into him, and if you actually listen to what he says, I think he's amazing. I think his dad's amazing. His dad was a a character in his day is a tough man. They, you know, they're tough fighting men. But the, he's raised a bunch of good lads. And they're lads. They're boys. They're not angels. But if you actually look at them fundamentally, they're all pretty decent guys. And I just think they're a credit. I think they're great. I'd love to, to meet Tyson. I'd love to, be, I'd love to be involved in his training because I think 
I think he there's things that he that he that he could do better. Uh, and I don't think I'm a better fighter or even in that league. But I don't think you have to be a great fighter to be a great trainer. I think that I I I think I have wisdom in the fight game that I could probably become a good trainer. But I see things in Titan that I would enhance that I think would make him so much better. He's so talented. He's, he moves like a middleweight. Speed, reflexes. He's, he can fight both ways. I think he. he I think I'm glad that he's. Uh, I think Ben Davidson did an incredible job with him mentally. I think that Ben is really smart. I think he lacks a bit of experience in boxing circles, but but I think he's a very very bright kid who's you know probably done a lot of research and. I'm not sure of his boxing background, but I don't think he can buy experience. So, uh, but I just think that um, I think Fury is possibly, and and the ways he's, he's maintaining his stability right now. It, if he maintains discipline for the next two three years, he could very well be the greatest ever. You reckon? I, I mean it, and that and that and that puts and I'm talking. Muhammad Ali as well. You think yeah. I'm crazy? It, um, you think I'm crazy? Well, let me tell you something. If 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 Tyson Fury remains on course, if he goes and walks through Anthony Joshua, which I think he'll stand Joshua on his head. Um, I think he's too big, too smart, too. I think he'll knock knock him out. He's he's, he's I think he's a whole other level. I love Anthony Joshua as a human being. I love him as a fighter. I think Tyson Fury's got too much um, for him. Um, but if he beats Anthony Joshua, who else is there for him to beat? He'll beat Deontay Wilder, Klitschko, Joshua. Who else? He's unbeaten. Who 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 you want him to fight next? I, I don't think you're crazy. I just not heard it before. I mean, going back, I, the, you know, guy, I think he's on course to be. I don't think now. I don't think he's he's had the fights to prove it. But I don't. I mean, Deontay Wilder, I mean, look at his record, 45 and all, 45 knockouts and beat everybody. He just made him look like a clown, just went through him like he was irrelevant. I mean, that's why people don't respect May Mayweather. is so much better than, look at Canelo, he's, he's, he's terrifying. He's a, he's a great fighter. He fought Floyd, Floyd made him look like a little boy, just embarrassed him. That's how good Mayweather is. That's why people... They can talk about Floyd Mayweather, this, that, and the other. When he beats Pacquiao, when he beats De La Hoya, when he beats Canelo and makes it look easy, that's when you realize how great this man is. Whether you like him or you don't, no one else could go in there with Canelo and just play. He just By the end of the fight, Canelo, he didn't even want to... He, he, had, he tried for eight rounds, and then if you watch the last four rounds, he didn't even want to engage because he was getting hurt. They all say Floyd does a punch. He was hurting Canelo, and Canelo just ended up getting to the end of the round and surviving on a points loss. But if you watch the fight very closely, the back end of the fight, Canelo almost stops engaging because he just he was getting beat up, and that's how good Floyd is. Um, you know, people who know the fight game, they know. But you know, from the outside, people think Floyd's. Uh, I I find Floyd one of the best. But I love watching his defense. Um, but that's just me. It's, you know, part of boxing is defense and offense. I love Sugar Ray Leonard. I love all the great, um, even Muhammad Ali in his prime, very hard to hit. I find it exciting when people make people miss. Um, that is, the, my old trainer used to say to me, if you can't hit you, they can't beat you. That's part of the game, is making people miss. I don't think it looks great when a great fighter is getting hit. So people love blood and gore. I love the signs. Make them miss, make them pay. That's Floyd. That's Tyson Fury. There's never been a heavyweight in the history, almost seven foot tall, who fights like a middleweight. He's like lightning speed, incredibly difficult to hit. I said to Freddie Roach, who was my trainer, I said to Freddie, because he worked with Tyson Fury, how good is he? And he said, better than he looks. He's better than he looks. And he, he's odd to watch. He's odd to watch because of, because of his frame. He's so big. Because the way he moves does not match up with the build he is. 
I mean, I, I, sorry, going back, like I said, I, I used to hate him. I couldn't stand it. And then I listened, I listened to a, a, Joe, a, a podcast with him, like this, a long form, Joe Rogan podcast, about an hour. And, and, and Tyson's open about his two-year drama. He was completely open, honest with himself. He, there was no show on. He knows when to put the show on and when to be himself. And in his podcast, he was himself. And I thought, man, this guy is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Love. Where he's been, how honest he is now, and the show he puts on. And then he goes and boxes, and the size he is, he just does not match up. When, uh, as in, the, when we're looking at it, it's like physics is all wrong. And uh, and then, you know, a lot of people, um, so you, you, I, I am, I'm one of them. I'm your casual boxing fan, is what I am. Um, uh, but I have the luxury of being, a, I think, as a casual boxing fan, most people wouldn't have, have really known who Deontay Wilder was. And I'm talking armchair boxer finally ears pick up when a British, British boxer comes on and nothing else and their mates are ranting about it. I didn't know who Deontay Wilder was. And then uh, and then I didn't see more about it. Mate, that guy's a savage. An absolute, absolute savage. I like you saying. Uh, people don't survive one punch from him. And Tyson Fury in that first fight took two and got up and that <laughs> that last round, mate. That last round. And then the second and then the second fight takes him to the cleaners. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, mate. Listen, listen um, how, long, how, long how, long, how long do we have left? Because I've, uh, I have another <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I was about to say sorry, uh, sorry to the missus. No, no, no. Can yeah. come and say hello on the podcast. Come and say hello. Are they coming up? Yeah, okay. I have another <laughs> meeting. So, do can we round it up, mate? Sweet, we're done. Listen, Gary, absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'll let you know when this is going out. And um, where can people find you? Where do people find me, Yen? Where do people find me? Oh, you can find me on Twitter. On Twitter. Instagram. Instagram. And <laughs> Facebook. Facebook. What are my Twitter accounts? Okay. Uh, Twitter is Mr. Gary Stretch. Twitter is Mr. Gary Stretch. And then yeah. Instagram is Gary Stretch Official. Instagram is Gary Stretch Official. And then the Facebook. I'm not and sure. Facebook's just Gary Stretch, I believe. Yeah, right. I don't, that's how much social media I do. My I love it all. I'll I'll put them all in the description. Instagram is better. And yeah, what what is it? Uh, Gary Stretch official. Gary Stretch official. Yeah. Mate, everyone needs a good woman in life. <laughs> Come and say hello. Come and say hello. Come on. Come and say hello. She's gorgeous, my girl. Hang on. Hang on. I want to show the world my beauty. <laughs> Hello, nice Hi. to meet you. Thank you for all the social media information. This is Yin, to... so you know, Yin, Yin produced the Ronda documentary with me. She was the Very exec well producer. Done. Right. She was the exec producer, the line producer, and the music supervisor. Right. And, Very well done. And my backbone. Okay. <laughs> Changed my life. I'm like a pussy. I'll catch you so, later on, buddy. You, listen. I, I love your show, and uh, I'm really flattered and honoured that you call me. And uh, uh, great seeing you again. And I'm, I'm always there if you need me. Well, mate, if it's alright with you, I'm going to hook you up with a British MMA podcast run by another veteran. Granite okay, Zero whatever, podcast. Whatever you want to do, but God bless Sweet. you. Thanks, and I appreciate you calling me. You're a star, mate. Stay God safe. Bless. God bless. Bye, bye.